next one here is a no heat call on a residential unit and uh, basically they lost power last night and they're wanting us to see what's going on. So if I get permission to record it, I'll do it. Um, that's something I don't usually do is record the residential stuff, but uh, I'm starting to help out a little bit with some of the apprenticeship program at our workplace. And so I was asked to make uh, a few videos recording the stuff just as long as I got customer permission. If I do get permission, I will make the video. Yeah, we're going to check and see if we got our power coming into it. So let's check that first. There's our primary coming in. So let's see if we got it. So I got it to there. Well, I'll leave you though. Oh, no, that's fine. Whatever. Okay. If you're interested, that's fine. I, the more you know, the more it helps take care of, you know, the little problems. All right. Yep. Okay, there's 122. All right, good. So we got 122 coming into it. That means our transformer probably went out. So, is there a power switch for this that we can turn off? I think so. Is that it? Yep, that's it. So we'll check our resistance here on our secondary. So our secondary comes in at 1.2. Let's see what our primary is. Yeah, you can smell it. It's burnt. So it took the transformer out. Hopefully that's all it took out. Yeah, our primary. Our primary is completely open. We have no resistance on it at all. So that uh, is one way you can find out. Because if it was on our secondary, we'd know there's a short on the uh, other side of the transformer, basically the load side of the transformer, but there's not. We know it's on the primary, so that means it was a voltage issue coming in. So something took it out on the voltage side of things, which the customer said they had problems with the power going out and coming back on, and then, then they had no heat afterwards. So one system worked, one didn't, and that's what we got so far. Whew. Yeah, that thing's toasty critter. Oh yeah, so, I've yep. smelled that before. Yep. Yeah, you can see it got kind of warm there and that transformer right there is maybe the only problem hopefully so because i mean for not to damage your zone system and all that it's really amazing so it was it running by chance do you know when it did all that weird stuff no idea okay let me use these funny little small ones oh, we'll put those in there All right, you want to go ahead and turn it back on? We'll see if it blinks. Yeah, we got power. Check that out. So total amperage is right at about eight. So that sounds about right. This is a pretty good size furnace. 120,000 BTU. And five ton geothermal. Now we can put it in auxiliary heat and make sure that's working too. That way we've checked everything before we go. Yes. Okay. And now, and now, Riddle me this. Sure. So um, I turned this off here and it would come right back on. But then when I. I this would? It'd like make a hum noise? Yeah. Okay. But then when I lay of some sort. Yeah, right now it's just getting the G signal only. So the thermostat probably is waiting. So we don't just fix one problem and leave, we make sure everything else is working right. Check our water temperatures coming in and out. Okay, this is a five ton unit. Yep, 64, so we'll look for 64 here. 64, we've got entering water temperature at 30 degrees, coming over to full load, which we don't have the second stage energized yet. But your water temperature drop bill will be between four and six, and we're right at five, so, so far, pretty close to being where we need to be at. So we need to get her into the second stage and then we'll make sure. All right, so we're gonna check our pressure drop across our coaxial coil. So we take our gauge here and we've got our incoming here. So we've got right at 42, 
42 pounds. Yeah, 42 pounds. So we can note that. Put 42 here. And then we'll come back at the top. Come into there. Right at about 40. 39, let's just say 39. So it's a mixture between 39 and a half. So either way, we've got three pound differential. So come down to here, we find out what is our gallons per minute. So on a 64 at a 30 degree outdoor temperature, a three pound drop is gonna be about 14 gallons per minute. That's total gallons per minute for the whole system. Now we've got two systems here. You've got a two ton and you got a five ton and they basically share the loop between the two of them. So they go to the circular pumps. This is what drives the water out, up over and goes outside the house and goes out into the yard. And there's a large ground loop, water loop out there. So that water goes out into the ground, loops back horizontally. It's gotta be calculated out, but it's, it's well over probably a thousand foot of total line. And then comes back into the machine. So this is where your calculations of your temperature and water come into play. So we're running a grand total of 14 gallons per minute. Okay, you got a five ton, oh, a 64, and a, that one's a 26. So let's say two ton and five ton, so you get seven ton. Seven times two gallons per minute would be 14 gallons per minute. So we got about two gallons per ton per unit. And then when you do this, you should have your hot water generator, which this right here goes up over and it's not located around here, but that is going to go to their water heater. So you get some free heat. It'll temper the water before it goes into the water heater. You'll get your most savings generally in the summertime when you don't want the heat and it's going to go into that tank. Uh, if it's a gas water heater, usually we use two tanks. One's just a buffer tank and the other one's the actual normal hot water tank. Um, and uh, same thing with electric sometimes, just depends. So we got that there. So that should be off, which we can pull that wire off down here. That's 120 volts. So that'll shut that one down. Make sure it don't short into anything. Uh, this unit here is a two-stage unit. So we don't know if it's running in two-stage yet. But like I said, we know we're running the right gallons per minute. So we come back down to here and look at 64 at 30 degrees at, we're running right actually about two gallons per ton give or take so we're gonna do with that middle one right here like I said we have 14 gallons total capacity on this unit you have a total of about seven tons of cooling give or take a little touch there so it's two gallons per ton so you here's your two gallons per ton coming across with no active hot water generator which is what we unhooked here that circulator pump that circulator pump there runs the water to the water heater so you don't want that running because it's going to steal heat away from the system and uh, skew your numbers our air rise should be 21 to 27 degrees water temperature should be six to eight so we come back in here we check our temperatures we're running right at 26 and a half degrees and we did have 33 originally Sometimes that leak's just gotta poke at it and make it stop. Or you can just put the cap back on. So we're at 33 degrees. Do your math there. Just say it's 27, so you're at six. So really about six and a half degrees. What did we say it was supposed to be? Coming down to your 30 mark, six to eight. So we're right in there. This is why you don't put your gauges on it because no sense of putting it in there if you don't need to. So that is how you calculate whether or not the system's performing right. It's just like a regular air conditioner. If you're low on refrigerant, your temperature drop's gonna suck. Your condenser's not gonna be very hot. So it's the same thing here. Your water is not gonna react. So it's the same thing. This is basically a regular air conditioner. You've got a Scroll compressor here. You got a metering device, it's a TXV. You got a reversing valve back there in the back, or a three way valve, depending on where you're from. Some people call it different things. You got a regular old contactor and a control board here. Um, your refrigerant ports are right here. 
And back here in the back, you have a coaxial coil. That's a tube and tube design. And so the water from the outside loop goes around the outside of the refrigerant line that's inside of it. That's how it extracts or rejects the temperature of the refrigerant. There, it just changed pitch. It just went to second stage. And the blower just speed it up. So now we can retake our measurements. So anyhow, back to the, how this works. Basically, that's a tube and tube design there. And that's how it extracts or rejects the heat from the refrigerant lines into it. I also have a demonstration of how a commercial one works, which is the same thing. This is a dual fuel system. So we have a 95%, 93% furnace there. And here is a design of a water heater being fed from the geothermal. I'm trying to cover a bunch of things at once. Here we are, two tank system. Basically we're coming out, going into the water tank, coming in and going out. So this right here, indoor compressor section, double water tank, typical hot water generator. So they'll come into the bottom through the drain port, they have a T with a drain, goes into there. A lot of times you'll shut down your electric water heater elements if it's an electric one. Um, just depends, like this is two electric ones and then sometimes with the gas, I don't know if they even show a gas one, probably not because they're all about electrical, you know, and the electric thing here. So that's how those tanks wire up. This one says Carrier on it. This is before Carrier bought, which I believe used to be Florida Heat Pump. And this one's made by Climate Master. So now we're running our second stage. We're at 24. So we're getting a little bit better uh, drop out of it because the water's gonna come in warm. It's gonna go out colder because you're extracting the heat out of it. So at 24 going out, and I think we have about 32 point something. So that's eight degrees right there. And that's what we showed on the other chart here. So water drop should be between six and eight. We had six on low, we had eight on high. So the heat pump's working fine. Now what I'm gonna do on the furnace, I'm gonna check the condensate uh, trap, make sure it's clean. And then, uh, depending on how long has it been since we've done a service on it. Just fall. We just did it? Yeah. Okay, so really most of that's already probably been done then. Because a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go ahead and clean out the condensate trap here because those tend to get plugged up. And then the flame sensor's up here in the top. This customer's really cool and was okay with this uh, recording. Um, like I said, I'm trying to make these just to help out some of the young guys. And we have some uh, apprentices that were started with our own company. And we're going to use these to train them because you can't always have them with you. So our draft motor came on. Blower shut down. Fires off in a high fire. And it'll drop down to a low fire. This is propane gas, so we got a little bit of orange in there. That's normal. Flame is bluer now. Yeah, because at first startup, a lot of times you'll have uh, dust. Like if I oh. take my fingers and kind of put them over here like this, see how ah. orangey-ish it gets. Yeah. So. All right, we're at 68 degrees return. And all right, the battery went dead, so I didn't get the temperature rise on uh, video. So we had 68 going in on the return, and we had 92 coming out, so we had a 24 degree delta T. The average per the chart was 21 to 27, so we're right in the middle. This is my pressure gauge. It's just a regular suction pressure gauge. Inside there is a little port to slow down the fluttering. So I drilled that out and just adapt it to a PT uh, pressure port uh, adapter. Adapted it down to the uh, pressure port adapter, which looks like a needle that you'd use on a basketball, football, whatever. So that's how I check my pressures. I like having the negative there because that allows me to see if they've got more issues than just a little bit low. When you're on a pump, a big pump, you can pull into a negative and just it's nice to see that sort of thing. And I had the gauge laying around, so you don't have to have a high dollar uh, gauges. Today we're doing a bunch of maintenance on geothermal units. And I thought I'd take a second to kind of go over something that I used to have problems with. Because whenever I asked a question about how do you check a geothermal out, I never got a straight answer. 
and didn't really understand the water pressure differential on far as how to calculate your gallons per minute and really didn't understand the temperature drop across your coaxial coil because you want to keep constant flow of water going through there of anywhere from one and a half to three gallons per minute per ton. What we're doing on our check here is we're using the good old field piece probes. Nice thing about these are I can clamp onto the copper and it gets a fast accurate measurement right away. This is on a ground loop system. This particular one because there's so many of them have little uh, blemo valves here to stop the flow when it's not being used. That kind of helps save your coaxial coil a little bit. Some places use them, some places don't. We're not going to go real deep into it but we're basically going to just give you a basic overview of what we got going on here. This one here is a little bit fancier because it has a reheat coil on it and a reheat coil is used for dehumidification in this particular instance. This valve right here which is located right there is a modulating valve and what it's going to be if you look and imagine the water coming through this way and basically it's a three-way valve it's open here open there and open there so in this position here when it's running normal mode that valve's open it's going right on through it would try to come this way but because it's closed right here it can't go that way so it only has one way it can go right in and back out now when it goes into that reheat mode for dehumidification it's going to rotate itself to this position blocking the water coming in and it's going to allow it recirculate on itself they also have a pump in here a little circulator like a little taco type style pump comes into the coil here that's right after the evaporator and will just recirculate on itself what this is going to do is you got a cold coil and a hot coil and or I should say warm and they're going to neutralize each other but you're going to have dehumidification process go on so that's how the reheat section works and then if it gets too hot because they have thermistors on there it'll open up and uh, put it back to normal you've got a flow valve right in here basically you can check your pressure drop there versus outgoing usually which I think with this one here they're doing it all off of the valve there by itself now this one doesn't have two sets of them usually say it's a regular geo for like a residential pressure ports will be right on the ingoing and outgoing of where they come out from the uh, geo itself the reheat coil that I was talking about earlier is right here the coil that would have the water coming from out of the coax coil uh, instead of coming out of uh, and going right back into the system it would come into this coil here back behind here is your evaporator in between there is a like a freeze stat so if by chance you are running this coil to get dehumidification that's when that valve over there on the side will either put the water into this coil or to run it in the coax coil which is located way back here in the back so this right here is just glycol in it um, depending on the type of system it could be ethanol methanol and polypropylene just depends on the type of system you're working on this particular unit because they're doing kind of a, a zoning system approach just use the basic PSC fan motors uh, some of the ones you see in the houses uh, generally will have an ECM motor on it but that right there is a geothermal system it's a water to air system if you wanted to call it that basically a little mini chiller uh, you're just pulling the water out of the ground the ground will hold temperature a lot better than the air does and you'll either extract it or reject it into the ground loop which you know they size that appropriately based on how many tons it is